There we go. Can you all see my screen? Perfect. Right. Perfect. Let's go try. So let's spend a few seconds and talk about the state of data security. And I think I think it kind of puts the sets the stage to where we're at in the world. Um, you guys, as security buyers and users and consumers. Um, are all aware that the investment is as big as it's ever been. It continues to be growing. Um, you know, we all have budgets or, or most of our um, customer bases have budgets for what I'll call the basics, right? You've, you've got budgets for, for DLP and EDR and intrusion detection and AV and all those kinds of things. Um, and, and I call those the basics because they're the, really the foundations or the building blocks of, of a good security structure and, and ecosystem. Um, but the reality is it's not enough. Um, technology is either failing in some cases or has gaps. Um, there are risks that, that you know, you'll pick up a solution that you think is the right solution to fix a problem uh, or to solve a use case. And, and there's risk and threats that remain maybe underexposed or, or too hard to maintain. Um, and what's really interesting of late is the, the continuous change to the security stack. And what I mean by that is you, you spend money on solutions that are not designed to be disposable. Um, yet you find yourself buying a solution and a year or two later migrating it to something different, right? Trying something new, trying something different, um, you know, trying something that doesn't fail. We work with Atlantic Data Security in particular on trying to help the organizations think differently. And we've been doing it for some time um, here at DG and, and with AADS um, to help our customers um, in some of the ways that they've been thinking differently. In particular, uh, investing based on speed of operation. And when I talk about speed of operation, what I'm talking about is the ability to consume a solution and have that solution not just deploy quickly, but provide value out of the gate, whether it be compliance driven, whether it be you know, intellectual property driven, whether it be you know, straight security, um, you wanna be able to get out a, a speed of operation to it. Um, with so many solutions, over 4,000 vendors in the space, um, our, our customers are also providing solutions or selecting solutions with consumable insight. Um, human readable English language type, you know, insight into the security infrastructure. Um, depending on the size of your organization, if you're a mid-sized company or a large company, then the number of alerts and incidents and logs and data that you consume uh, is probably proportionate to the size of the company and the size of your stack. Um, and it, wouldn't it be great if you could take some of that data and feed it directly back into the organization, right? So if there was a marketing organization that was creating security risk and you had the ability to take that insight and provide it directly to the marketing team without having to filter through a security structure first, uh, I think it would make all of our lives easier. And it's gotta be human readable for people outside the security infrastructure. Um, planning for sustainable efficiency. Again, these, these solutions are not designed to be disposable. Uh, a sustainable, efficient solution is one that is uh, able to provide security for the challenges, the threats, the vectors that you run into today. It's also available, prepared, and ready to go for the future. And I'll talk about what I mean by that um, as far as, as, you know, you don't want to have to go out and build rules and policies and threat hunt for everything that you don't even know is out there. Um, and you don't want to find yourself on the cover of the Wall Street Journal or, or the Times or wherever else either. So um, that sustainable efficiency is a future proof of, of the solution. And then finally, the third, uh, the last point, the fourth point before we jump into you know, how ADS and, and DG do it together uh, is partnering with security experts. Um, this has become a trend, whether it be advisory services, uh, the types of services that ADS offers, whether it be managed services and staff augmentation, which are some services that both uh, ADS and DG provide, the security expertise is great because at the end of the day, whether it's a staff augmentation, whether it's a, a retaining and hiring staff, uh, whether it's just wanting to be able to get that speed of operation out of the box and just whip the, the need to understand a new solution, um, most of our customers are starting to look at this and say, we're going we're gonna to partner with security experts um, so that one, we're more efficient, two, I can answer the question to my senior leadership that we are in fact secure. So a little bit about DG and Atlantic Data Security. Um, we, we work in, in this wonderful ecosystem and it's become a partnership that's been quite successful for us. So when we talk about ADS, if I, if I tout their wares for a few seconds, um, they, they have this thing called support aware and you'll see the left and the right side of the screen have the same thing, but some different purposes. So if you're not working with them today or if you are working for them today, at the beginning of the ecosystem, you, you, they really provide some wonderful services around process delivery and uh, defining of, of best practices and security practices 
um, some gap analysis, right? When they find a gap uh, in those solutions, in the case of let's say data protection, those folks will then suggest solutions. And one of those will probably be Digital Guardian if it was around data protection. That's when DG comes in with the Atlantic Data Security team to talk about how to protect the data. And when we talk about data protection in particular at DG, we're talking about data loss prevention, we're talking about insider threat, and we're talking about EDR. Um, it's basically, you know, you, you need the insight and the telemetry. You gotta be able to identify the data that you care most about. And then at the end of the day, can you eliminate the exposure and the risk within the organization? It really boils down to those three things. Uh, we'll come in and work with the Atlantic data folks. We'll, we'll either replace DLP solutions that may be legacy, get you into that future-proof state. Um, I'll talk about how we do some of those things in a second, but then when we're done, you know, DG is great at making a, a solution that works in the environment, but then again, you've got that, that skills gap or that, that need of efficiency. That's when we hand the ball back to somebody like ADS on the backside, where then they can do optimization and policy review and health check and administration. So there's, there's this ever-ending cycle of, of the partnership between DG and, and Atlantic Data, or I should say Atlantic Data and all of their, their vendor partners. Um, that's how we really have been successful with them throughout the, the life cycle of the, of the process and the relationship. So let's say you have uh, a problem, you have identified gaps in the technology. I like to call this the keeping you up at night side. You've realized, holy cow, there are three things in my organization that I struggle with, even though I have these you know, massive amounts of tools. Um, I try to sort of simplify it into, into three simple steps, right? Um, everybody at the end of the day, no matter whether you're talking about DLP or, or any security solution, it boils down to you need to be able to locate and identify the data that you care about, right? Um, not all data is the same, but there are similarities, right? Uh, so when we talk about finance data, we're really talking about websites and shares and PCI and PII, but you'll see that it's real similar when we talk to technology companies who still deal with PII. Uh, they still deal with intellectual property and websites, maybe manufacturing and compliance data. Um, all of that data boils back into, there are, there are about eight different sets of data that, that all of our customers across the 300 and some odd uh, cloud hosted customers that we have boil back into, I just really need to be able to identify, accurately identify these pieces of data. Regardless of industry, once we've done that, control is consistent, right? It doesn't matter whether I'm in finance or I'm in retail or I'm in manufacturing, At the end of the day, containment is the consistent challenge. I need to be able to understand the exposure. I need that visibility and that analysis. And I'll talk about that in a second. I need to be able to put controls in place where I can keep that data from either being stolen from an outsider threat or, or accidentally leaving the organization, either due to privileged insiders, data loss or, or insider risk. Uh, and the ultimate, if you, can, if you can fix this third point, the ultimate is, can I put a balance between data freedom and security into place? Can I control the data inside the organization so that we're not actually losing data, but, but let my employees have the flexibility uh, to be actual, you know, to do their jobs, to have that daily use, if you will. And then the third piece of the, of the what keeps our customers up at night, building and maintaining talent, right? Partnering with security experts I talked about is something that everybody's doing. Reason being is once you have a, a solution in place and you've trained up your folks on how to use Digital Guardian or whatever your firewalls are, they've just become more marketable, they've just become more expensive, oftentimes you lose that talent. Um, depending on the size of your organization, the ability to manage the security to IT relationship, which isn't always the same group, databases and infrastructure, all those things become a challenge. Um, and the reality is Digital Guardian has been trying to, to, to work you know, in, in the space to control all three of these for about 15 years now. Keeping to pace. I know that you're, you're sipping that tequila. If you haven't, it's a good shot time. I need to come up with a keyword. Every time I say Digital Guardian, do we have to do a shot? Um, uh oh, the games have already started. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so it's been our sole focus for over 15 years. Uh, DG has been working in the partner community to do what we call no compromise data protection. Um, at a high level, we're the industry's only fully cloud delivered data protection solution. Um, and I'll talk about the delivery models. Um, we still have an on-premise model if you're cloud averse, but we're really the, the only one in the industry um, that's fully powered by AWS with zero infrastructure that has to be put into place. Again, getting back to that speed of operation. There's no infrastructure, there's no databases, there's no uh, arguments between IT and security, it's fully cloud delivered. 
Um, it is a cross-platform solution. So the, the solution supports Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, it offers the deepest visibility in the industry. And when I say deep visibility, it's a buzzword that you'll hear a lot of security providers play. We take it to the nth degree and I'll explain what I mean by that. But at a high level, you put the solution in the environment and we see every, every single piece of data that's moving around. And then it's the question of, do you really wanna see all that data? And can you tune it down to what you really care about? Behind that, again, I said, no policy, no problem at the beginning. That deep visibility gives us that consumable insight without any policies in place. The difference between DG and a lot of, of the competitive DLP, EDR, even insider threat programs, is you have to tell them what to look for. You have to say, I care about PCI or ITAR, or I care about intellectual property protection. And, and so as a result, the security organization says, go find that data. And a lot of DLP providers are really good at protecting that data. The question is what's happening below the waterline, right? The bottom half of that igloo or you know, what's going on behind the locked door that you can't see. That no policy, no problem is we're gonna take that deep visibility, whether there's a policy in place or not, and give you consumable insight first, and then go back and apply flexible controls to say, what is an acceptable level of risk? What do I really care about? Did I know that this was happening inside the organization? And so it's a complete opposite approach. And at the end, we're gonna put comprehensive classification in play. We're gonna do the content inspection. We're gonna do the, the, use the keywords and the, the regular expressions. And then on top of everything else, we're gonna add this concept called context. I'm gonna know that I'm an engineer and then I work with source code and that I downloaded the source code. I checked it out to work on it from the GitHub repository as an example. And so as a result of those three actions, I no longer need to do content inspection of a billion lines of code. I can make contextual decisions to say those three things mean that this is source code. And when that engineer is done compiling that piece of source code, we're automatically gonna classify it contextually, right? It's a false positive proof way to identify sensitive information. Any questions so far? All right, I'll keep rolling through it. Um, DG does it different and I've hinted about that, but this is really, if I were to kind of stack it into a process and, and you'll see I've mapped this to the NIST framework for, for the side of, of insider threats. Um, you could do this same thing if you were talking about um, EDR to a MITRE framework. Um, if you were worried about uh, some of the government stuff, you could put it into ITAR or CMIC uh, as Chuck and I were talking about yesterday. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is the concept, this is the philosophy. So we start with this cross-platform visibility at the core. Um, we're collecting all data events, all network events, all system events. And when I say all, I mean everything, every open, every close, every copy and paste, every attachment, every mount of a USB. And then what we do is we feed that into this intelligence engine, which is that consumable insight. That's where we'll automate and correlate all those data so that I'm not looking at millions and trillions of events. I'm looking at a flow of data that makes sense to the consumable eye. I see that Stephen opened up a file, he downloaded it to his machine, he moved it to a USB key, he then unplugged that USB key, right? That's a risk that we can identify in succession by correlation. And as a result, I can say, this is an acceptable action or geez, Stephen really shouldn't be doing that. So maybe we wanna put some level of control into that. And so based on that intelligence, we've changed the conversation. Now as security individuals, you can take that data without any policy and fix the problem between security and the business unit. Most business units don't want security. They don't want to be hindered from doing their job. If you could go back to an organization within your company and say, these are the things that I see happening with the data. This is the risk that I see incurring in your environment. You tell me, is that okay? Or is that an unacceptable risk? And then I'll go and build policy around that. It's a bottoms up approach. If that organization says, gosh, that's really not something that should be happening. Then we move into the controls and we apply this flexible level of controls. Um, and at the end of the day, we keep it all in this investigative forensics reporting and analytics engine. So as a process, we take this, you know, let's secure the business, let's have a minimal impact and let's reduce risk within the organization. And when I talk about minimal impact, what I really mean is I'm not gonna impact the endpoint, right? The, what we're doing is gonna not slow down the machine. It's not gonna cause blue screens. It's not gonna cause problems to the environment. And it's also gonna have minimal impact on the customer's ability to do the job, right? Your, your, your end users are gonna to continue. Top-down use cases, fully supported. So if you know that there are things in your organization, we simply have to control. I need to do USB, web, email, cloud, uh, name your exfiltration. 
and I want to I want to be able to identify and protect sensitive information from going to those. We'll start out with those policies. It's low hanging fruit, but the bottoms up approach is what makes us unique. As we see risk in the environment, we'll bubble that risk up. So as we see uh, maybe backups of your of your email systems going to USB drives or backups of the of the file uh, for Outlook. Your PST file, for example, maybe that's something that you weren't actually looking for, but you see that there's a systemic problem inside the organization where once those PST files are backed up, people can recreate their emails off the off the machines that are corporate. Maybe that's something that we want to control. And so we start to bubble these things to the top and say, are these acceptable levels of risk? Again, future proofing the solution risks that we haven't even identified yet because they haven't occurred. All right. We're going to be able to see those with this philosophy raise them as a security individual and say, these are things that I really need to care about. Make sense? Perfect. We do this all through a couple different models. Um, so we have an on-premise SaaS and a managed service model. Uh, again, all with the Atlantic data security is part of the, you know, which makes most sense for our customers. Um, the, the, on, the SaaS environment and the managed service environment are AWS hosted. Um, they are either customer managed or either Atlantic data security or DG managed. And the licenses are all based on a subscription model. So at the end of the day, we try to be super flexible. Um, we try to be able to provide a security service that allows you to control the flow of data um, all while not controlling the flow of data to the, the daily business use. Um, I guess I'll take a breath and pause there for a moment. And then I'll talk about a couple places where you can find some of this data and get you guys to the tequila faster. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so the EDR part of this, is that SAS or an MSP or it is. is it optional in both both situations? It's, it's So it's optional. So when we talk about the services that we're approaching, right, it's, it's one platform. It's a single agent that does essentially all of the capabilities. So that single endpoint agent, if you're talking about the endpoint, collects all of that data. If it's outsider threat, right, if it's um, it didn't pass a threat feed or, or it's a behavior or I've seen um, uh, malicious encryption actions or lateral movement of files, we'll apply EDR policy, right? If it's, I see somebody accidentally moving files, uh, maybe it's somebody in HR that's accidentally sending, uh, you know, something from the employee database over email and it's going out over Gmail, we'll apply the DLP policies. They're licensed separately, but it's really around what risk we care about. And then again, it can either be self-managed, both DLP and EDR, or cloud-managed, uh, customer, sorry, DG ADS managed. Uh, so MDR services, if you're familiar with the term. Yeah, that's what I was trying to find out because in, in our situation, you know, like probably most everybody here, you have a, a limited set of cycles by everybody and not enough that's people right. to do everything, right? So yep, that's um, right. You know, we have a MSSP doing a lot of our monitoring, so. Sure. Um, can you do the on-prem to host it? We can. So you don't have the expense of the cloud and still um, have uh, MDR? We sure can. Um, so the, no, not the MDR, the EDR, yes. So if you put it on-prem, right, both ADS, unless you have an ADS body on site, both ADS and DG are gonna lose sight of that platform, right? It's, it's, it's lost to us, it's inside your environment. If it's in the cloud, we can manage it. Um, if you want to manage it yourself and you put it on-prem, you can still have the EDR service. You just can't have the managed service on top of it. Troy, quick question for you. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of the uh, session that a lot of companies will deploy a DLP uh, solution and, you know, it becomes legacy or they rip it out. So, you know, looking at McAfee, Semantic, Netscope, um, why? do companies put in a DLP solution and then end up ripping it out and replacing it with a yet another DLP solution? Any insight on that? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So, and then the, the answer can be a lot of things. Um, and I, I don't like to dog on the competition. I like to tout some of the things that we do. Um, we've made a lot of investment in um, not just future proofing it, but innovation, right? So when I talk about the analytics engine, we have a fully elastic search data at your fingertips. You don't have to write queries. You don't have to manage huge platform infrastructures, cloud hosted in the cloud for all of this data Atlantic, uh, data analytics. Um, a lot of that is innovation that's been done to make it easier. So some of our customers, and you can think about some of these legacy DLP, 
the product hasn't changed in 10 years in one particular case, it's legacy. Does it still protect USB? Sure. Does it still protect web? Maybe, right? If you think about the changes to Chrome browsers every month and the hmm. complications you have with regards to every time there's a change to Chrome or Edge or whatever the browser is, you got to go back and fix your browser because they're all using plugins, right? For example, that's a, that's a problem and it's, it's difficult to maintain. Um, the first time there's a piece of data that's lost that your DLP solution wasn't able to answer the question, what happened? Not that they didn't catch it because maybe the policy wasn't there, but what happened? Can you tell me the story of where that data came from, how it ended up getting taken, and can you give me something that's admissible in court so I can go get it back, right? That's another big piece of the puzzle that if you think about a lot of these legacy solutions, they're not answering that whole question. You only get this piece of data left your organization, but you don't know yep. the history of the story behind it. Um, the after fact. That's right. Um, so, some so, so, DLP solutions are just being priced out. They don't want to keep their customers anymore. So one particular vendor is raising their prices three, four, five times because they're trying to exit the space, right? They only want top 200, top 2000. So, so we talked about configuration profile and obviously there's a, a series of, of false pauses that be filtered through constantly. How about the integration with the other platforms, you know, like Box, Office 365, Google. Yeah. Um, are you guys running into the same limitations that other DLP companies are running into? No, Robert, that's a great question. So that's part of the innovation, right? So when we think about integration with Box, Ignite, SharePoint, the cloud story, um, while we're not a CASB yet, um, while we're not a CASB, um, we do have integrations through API, right? So we've added a lot of these API integrations so that we can do cloud discovery in the cloud, right? So if data discovery is important to you and you want us to be able to go back and, and do real time and, and scheduled scans for SharePoint in the cloud, we need to be able to have those API hooks to do it. And that's something that DG's done over the years. Um, Any limitation on size? Sorry? Any limitation, like let's take Box for an example. Any limitation, if you have a, if you have a company that has been a Box client for the past, I don't know, 15 years, is, repository a lot of data out there? Is there any limitation from the DZ side on being able to scan that on a routine basis or at least the initial uplift of looking at it from a, a compliance perspective, would that be PI, PHI or PCI? Uh, sure, so if you're doing scans, you'd be using this, if you're looking at the screen, you'd be looking at the, phys the appliance, which is virtual or physical. Uh, most of our customers have gone to virtual appliances and it's a scale. We don't charge by the number of instances. So if you want to throw them out there, it's by number of users that have access. And if they do an exorbitant amount of data, we're not charging any extra for that. So um, it's all around scale. If you have petabytes of data that you need to scan and you need to do it overnight, you just need more horsepower. If you need to do it in a week, you need less horsepower. And there's no charge by DG for doing that, right? We don't charge by the number of instances that you spin up. We charge by the number of places that you're going to go hunt for data. So if you have everything in one place, you have a thousand users that have access to that infrastructure. It's a thousand user license. Scale it up and scale it down, move it in, move it out, make some redundancies. We don't charge by the number of virtual appliances that our customers deploy. Thanks, Troy. Yeah, great question. I got just one background question. Uh, I see Splunk on the um, on the, <clears throat> the slide, but I heard Elastic. Um, are, are you elastic based for your, your um, yeah, so search the, tool? Yeah, uh, great question, Stephen. So the DG Arc is an analytics and reporting cloud based on Hadoop and an elastic HDFS Hive. Um, we have RESTful APIs and uh, in particular applications in the App Store for Splunk, for example, where we can feed that data back into your Splunk infrastructure, your Q radar, or whatever the sim is really. We're, we've not found one we haven't been able to at least send data to. Um, some of them are more uh, elegant than others, right? We've actually created apps for Splunk and Q radar. Um, we have the ability to do log exports for some of the secondary sims uh, and those kinds of things. But you can get the DG data right into the Elasticsearch, which is just essentially 30, 60, 90 days, configurable number of days, you want the live data at your fingertips. As long as it's just DG data, you can get it in the arc. When you talk about Splunk, that's when you're going to feed that back into your MSSP like you talked about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe into the SOC sim that ADS is watching for all the firewall data as well. And you can get that consolidation of data in one place. So one thing I've done a look at, uh, not really from a uh, 
POV, but uh, was elastic uh, in their security product. Uh, do you also support that? I have to look more into that. When you say, do I support Elastic in their security product? Yeah, uh, their, their Elastic has a SIM now that they're, they're trying to bring up and- Yeah, so it's not a partnership, it's more of a data feed. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, you got an API for, or an app for add-on. Uh, so we have Russell APIs, their JSON APIs that are open, so we could use those, or we could actually feed them the logs directly, right? So we can export the data and send it on a pipe directly to the, to the Elastic SIM or any SIM. Good question. Any other questions we got about, what is it, a few minutes left or are we over? Hey, Troy, uh, quick question. Sure, Javier. Um, how, do you, how do you treat use case where uh, uh, a data set that you're tracking, PHI, PAI, uh, get, gets encrypted and then moves around the organization? You know, encryption is always something that's tough for these type of technologies, you don't have the, the, the private key, right? You can't decrypt it. Um, do you actually track that, that movement um, as it goes through those, those various encryption? We do. Um, so if we're talking about on the endpoint in particular, because that's where you're gonna see it before it gets encrypted or even after it's been encrypted, um, the agent that sits on the endpoint is a kernel level agent. So I'm gonna see that file before it was encrypted and I'm gonna have a ability to do some inspection. If that file is encrypted and I no longer can see it, but sensitive data went into it, we're gonna do something called a persistent tag. We're gonna say, I know the data that went into that zip file that's now encrypted, for example, is sensitive information. So as a result, the corresponding zip file is gonna carry the same classification. As it moves around the organization and comes with it, that tag moves with it, as do the controls. So if I've said this is, classified as uh, corporate confidential, and it ends up, you know, three use cases later, let's say I, I moved it out to uh, a USB stick, it, that classified tag is still there. So if I'm not allowed to export that data because it was sensitive originally, the zip file is gonna get the same treatment. Great, thank you. Yeah, for sure. It's a big use case for DG, right? That's that contextual classification. We know the source file that went into that file that was, that was encrypted, was sensitive so contextually we can assume that the data is still in there and that zip file needs to have the same classification. Awesome, thank you. Great question. Do if somebody changes the zip file name? Uh, even if somebody changes the zip file name because we know it was this and we saw the file name change. So they could name it to familiesvacations.jpg, classification holds. They could open it up with a hex editor and replace it with an actual JPEG header, classification holds. It's actually one of the use cases that we demo out really, really well. Um, I know we're not set up today or, or have the time to do it, but if you ever want to see a demo of that, um, reach out to and, me or any of the DG folks. You, so you're, you're, you're saying with a, a header, so you're saying somebody could go in with a hex editor and change that to a JPEG hex designation and you can still Correct. catch it. Correct, 100%. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Great questions. Any other questions? Hey, Troy, I got one thing. I heard you say, you know, well, we're not a CASB yet. Um, can you just take one minute, tell me a little bit about your roadmap that you might have for the future, like web filtering, you go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so I can't say enough about, you know, roadmaps are always tend to change. Um, we've been adding CASB style use cases to our discovery. Oh, somebody was interrupting there. Um, we've been adding CASB style use cases. Um, when you think about the DG appliance that goes out into the cloud and the ability to do scans and SharePoint and OneDrive, and we already do a lot of CASB style use cases today. Um, one of the things that, that the roadmap is considering is, do we add a full-blown CASB? So when you think about DG, we're an enterprise DLP and EDR shop. When you think about Forcepoint or Semantic, they're a platform play, right? They have DLP and they also have CASB and they do some web filtering. Um, those are all things that are on the DG roadmap. Um, and those are all things that we're kind of prioritizing to figure out how quickly we're gonna bring those to light. Um, I suspect that it won't be super long before you see some of those things come into, come into fruition. I'd awesome. love to be able to give you a firmer answer. No, that's good, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, 
Find out a little bit more. Um, there's some some press out there. You can go to the DG website. Um, you can see some co-branded stuff with the managed security program uh, for DG uh, on our website. You can go to the Atlantic Data Security website and find some information. Uh, if you happen to be an AWS Marketplace customer, um, both DG and, a and AW, uh, ADS are offering the solution through the Marketplace. Uh, I know a lot of our customers like doing that. And there's actually a bundled, co-bundled offering uh, out there that you can you can see and learn and, and find out more information. So if you happen to be in the marketplace, um, those are options as well moving forward. So with that said, Donna, I'm going to get out of the way of tequila time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Troy. Thank you for that presentation. We appreciate you having um, having you speak with us today. If anyone does have any other questions, feel free to pass them over to your Atlantic rep or directly to me and I can get them uh, answered accordingly for you after the presentation today. Uh, and now we're gonna jump into the Cinco de Mayo portion of the event. If you don't have your ingredients handy, go ahead and grab them now. I did put the link to the recipes in the chat as well. Um, and before we start mixing the drinks, we actually have the owner of the distillery that made our tequila on with us today. And he's gonna tell us a little bit really quickly about what we're actually drinking. So Tyler, are you out there? Can you introduce us? Yeah, thanks Donna. Uh, it's great to see you guys. I, at this point, I feel like I'm part of ADS and, and the team there. Uh, that being said, I do want to uh, thank you guys. A happy Cinco de Mayo day. And Eduardo, are you out there? I'm looking for you somewhere on these, screen, on these countless uh, screens here. Um, Eduardo? See. Uh, well, well, he is getting on. Or uh, actually, David, are you on there? Let's see. Oh, that's a great start here. So, anyways, I will give a little rundown here. Uh, I'll see if they are actually on in the, part, in the uh, chat. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to let everyone know about this tequila that we do have it's called Arete Tequila. It's a Blanco. One of my personal favorite tequilas that we have in the entire store. And it's without a doubt the uh, number one selling tequila that we have. It actually outsold Jose Cuervo. Um, and on top of that, it's a fraction of the price. So usually you're paying about $30 or so New York state prices for Jose. This one's only like a fraction of that. And on top of that, on top of everything else, it's really probably the best value and the story behind it is great. Still looking for David who said he's on and he can give you a little bit more if, uh, let's see, I don't, 